Welcome to episode number 59 of the Social Exchange Podcast. This is Zach Rhodes. You're listening to the season 5 penultimate episode. Seasons don't really mean that much for a podcast like this one, where the vast majority of episodes are long-form interviews, but what it does mean is that I'm going to be upgrading the show's content. Um, I'll tell you just a bit about what you can expect in the next season, season 6, so hopefully you're up for just a little housekeeping. First, I've received a lot of feedback about the show over the past year. A ton of positive feedback, and I'm grateful for that. But a pretty regular criticism, critique, friendly critique that I hear is that I overpromise content. And regrettably, in retrospect, I have to tell you that I, I totally agree. I cop to that. I have a bad habit of communicating with a potential guest, someone who tells me that he or she will do an interview, and then I excitedly share the news with all of you, and then some percentage of the time, those interviews either fall through or they get postponed or something happens, and then I don't get you that content. So there's definitely a disconnect between my excitement and thinking that something's going to happen and then actually producing it and making sure that it does. And sometimes, you know, projects get postponed as well. Um, For instance, I began creating a video for Patreon that needed further production. So I told one of you, one of our patrons, that I would have it by two weeks ago, and it's still not up yet. It will be done uh, this week, and that's actually, that actually is a promise. But things like that happen all the time where I'm thinking that it's going to be launched and published and I tell you that it will be done then and sometimes things are out of my control and then I have to come back and apologize for it. So that's one thing that's going to be changing quickly, beginning now. I will let the shows speak for themselves, announcing projects and events only when they're ready to launch and hopefully that'll make things easier for people to follow. I do realize it's a quirk of mine and a, an area for growth, let's say that I I do want to make sure that I'm giving everybody value, including making sure that you understand what's going on. Another thing that's going to change is that there will be music. I, for a while, Aaron Ferguson was producing a lot of music that went with the show. And then there was a while there when he and I both got so busy with things that it was difficult for me to send out something and for him to just turn around and create brand new music very readily. I mean, he would always be willing to do it, but sometimes it would take a little longer. For my part, I probably wasn't giving him enough time. So we went with just sort of, you know, either old kind of music or no music and just kind of transition sounds and things like that. And that was another piece of feedback was people really liked when there was some sort of a regular kind of tune to the show, which is so interesting because in my personality is something I don't care at all about that. But apparently, most people do. So that's something that I will make sure that uh, will be included in the next episode. There will be tons of different music. You may not know this, but I'm a professional musician. I'll be playing a lot of the music for the intros and outros and transition. Pre-pandemic, I played at least a few live shows per month. So playing like transition background music and things like that for the show will give me some sort of direction and focus for my music anyway. And I know that it's going to add value on your end as well. I won't overpromise this, but if I do have time, then I can imagine publishing my songs once in a while as kind of standalone podcasts. And maybe that's something that uh, patrons will have first pri- privilege of hearing. But I can't be sure that I have time for that, so that we'll keep that in the, the dreamosphere, and I'll keep you posted. And another change that you should know about going into next season is that The social exchange will be limited to shows about social issues. So if it's philosophical, social, political, has to do with psychology or a popular topic, we'll discuss it. But a lot of what we've talked about on this show is addiction, harm reduction, and that does fall into that broader category I just mentioned. But all of that content around addiction and harm reduction and things like that that I would normally publish here is going to be published as episodes of another podcast I host called the LPP Podcast. LPP is the Life Process Program, which is an online coaching program that I work for and which was created by Dr. Stanton Peel. If you like the addiction episodes and when you like when I talk to addiction experts or hear, you know, talk, hear stories from people who have had addictions and overcome them and things like that, you're gonna ha- I'm going to direct you to the other podcast to listen to those. I don't know if this move is going to be super valuable to you directly, but I'm hoping it will. I do know that it's going to help me keep my thoughts straight, whereas I'll host interviews about addiction on one platform and interviews about social issues on this one. 
I know that leaves many of you needing to subscribe to one or the other or both, so I hope that's going to be an easy enough adjustment. Um, and again, I'll be linking to the LPP podcast in the show notes of this show now and moving forward. Lastly, I will be keeping a more regular cadence. In Season 6, all listeners can expect two episodes per month, every two weeks exactly, always on Thursdays. And patrons will continue to expect early access to those episodes, and they will also get one extra episode as well. That's all patrons. And then any other extra content that we agree to, depending on what you're donating. So again, there's this episode and then one more and then we'll be moving into a whole new season of the podcast with brand new updated features don't worry if you can't remember all that i will be reminding you and bringing all of you in for a smooth transition between the way the show operates now and the 2.0 version that you can expect a month from now i think that's it for housekeeping so let's bring it to today today's episode is a discussion about race with my new friend named bridget mack I learned about Bridget by watching a viral Facebook video that she posted, which was called, quote, You'll never guess what my white neighbor just came and said to me. The title, she says, was satirical, picking on the clickbaity headlines to which we've all become accustomed. Bridget, the black woman, really does have a white neighbor who really did approach her on that day, which was the day that George Floyd had been killed. But what her white neighbor came and told her was something wonderful and kind, as opposed to rude and ruthless, as the title may have led us to believe. So in her video, she offered a perspective about racism in America. And I listened to it. It was nuanced. It was thoughtful. Her words and tone and her passion in that video were all very honest. And I felt compelled to ask her if she would be on my podcast to discuss this topic in more detail. And happily, she agreed. People want to talk about race, and people don't want to talk about race. You know, peaceful protests, as well as some riots and looting, followed George Floyd's needless death, which contributed to one of the most massive movements that America has ever seen. But the incident and the protests also left many Americans silent, in shock and wanting to do or say something meaningful not knowing how or what, worried that whatever they said might be the wrong thing, and worrying that not saying anything, as has been suggested to them, is also the wrong thing. I received a lot of messages during the first two weeks of these protests, most of them from members of the discussion forums that I host, in which people told me they believe that the issue of race is a deeply important one to discuss, and an especially salient topic right now, And they were wondering if I'd be bringing it up. And they told me that they themselves were too afraid to speak about racism or police violence or Black Lives Matter just because it was such a difficult topic to discuss in good faith. White people in particular expressed concern. They worried that if they were going to engage in a conversation about race, that they may be misinterpreted or they may be unwittingly offending someone or that maybe what they believe to be civil and fair discourse is actually ignorant and offensive and they don't even realize it. In other words, these people who were talking to me would rather play it safe and say nothing rather than talking about it. And um, I'll admit that I share these concerns to an extent. My groups are discussion forums and they all operate under the auspices of free speech with a fuzzy set of rules and norms that helps people feel like they can express their thoughts and opinions and questions free of embarrassment or ridicule even if their ideas are way off track. In these groups, it doesn't matter if people get something wrong or even say something stupid, provided that they're expressing themselves in good faith. And as long as they're willing to change their views when confronted with solid evidence, and as long as they allow others to do the same. After all, if we can't get things wrong sometimes while we're thinking out loud, then we really can't be free to think or have these reasoned conversations in good faith. But race is a unique issue. And our current socio-political climate is unique as well. So I can see why racism is difficult to discuss. Racism is real. That's tautological. We know that. It occurs every day. And I believe that black Americans are particularly susceptible to its worst forms, both systemically and on an individual basis. So why would this be an easy issue to discuss? 
So perhaps it's okay that people who are unsure about what to say are listening instead. On the other hand, I believe that honest discourse comes to the rescue, especially when the topic is a difficult one to discuss. Discussions, trial and error, and real life participation and practice with other individuals, those are the ways which we humans learn. So I believe that starting the conversation, however uncomfortable, is an ethical imperative. And that's why speaking to Bridget was so constructive. My guest, Bridget Mack, is a black woman who lives in the South. She's encountered racism and knows that she will continue to do, almost certainly in worse forms than I ever will. For instance, she recalls having to worry constantly because there were active clan meetings happening in an adjacent neighborhood. She's had to stay hypervigilant at times in her life so that she didn't fall victim to racism. She gives examples in our interview, but it's just, it's not something that I can relate to personally. And, at the same time, Bridget encourages all Americans to move toward collaboration and continue progress and justice across ethnic and racial divides, rather than spending too much time and energy becoming angry and destructive. Interestingly here, I was the one who maybe was defending you know, those individuals who may be inclined to act in anger and with destruction, possibly because she or he feels that there is nothing else to do, nowhere else to turn, Things have been so bad for so long that what what else are they going to do? How else how else are they going to be heard? And she had a worthy rejoinder to this, which you'll hear. At the end of the day, Bridget prays that somehow we can get to a place in our society where the color of a person's skin, white or black or other, is the least interesting thing about them. This was a really pleasant conversation, and I hope that it inspires conversation among those in my own circle of influence, and especially those of you who have expressed concern that you can't express your own views in public. I think that you can. I think that people are more willing to listen than you might know, as long as you give it the right context. So I'll leave it at that. I'll let the episode speak for itself now. I'm really eager to hear feedback from all of you, and I want to thank you for listening and thank my guest today, Bridget Mack, also known as B. Mack Writes. with Bridget Mack, also known as B. Mack Writes. Bridget, grateful that you've joined me today and thank you for coming on the podcast. Oh, I am so happy to be here today. I'm speaking to listeners of the show now. Uh, First, give a bit of context on today's topic, uh, then I'll offer context about how I came upon Bridget's work and then then I'll let Bridget speak for herself because I think that she speaks more clearly and beautifully on these issues and frankly, I, I think you'll find her more interesting than you'll find me, generally speaking. (laughs) <laughs> uh, context for the show uh, we're going to be talking about race and racism we'll talk about the police and about both protests and riots in a commonsensical way just trying to make sense of some of those topics and then wherever else the conversation leads us we've all noticed of course that this socio-political climate is tumultuous in mm-hmm. the present moment and people in all social and political dimensions are really suspicious of one another and for various reasons and for some good reasons, but I don't think any of us are innocent of seeking some sort of tribe to contextualize ourselves in. Um, And if I'm correct about that, and I think I am, it means that fewer people are thinking rationally and critically and just from a, a, a values base and fewer people are thinking for themselves now than maybe in recent years. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the social exchange, the show itself is, you can go back and listen to any episode. It's centered around social issues that I'm interested in and also ones that my listeners suggest. And the basic principles of the show are that I'll never turn away from a chance to have an interesting conversation, no matter who it's with, no matter how much people might dislike a person or his or her ideas, so long as I believe that speaking with the person is going to help me incorporate into my worldview, a more complete version of the truth. And, um, Historically, there have been no topics that I have been timid to discuss because any listener of the show and anyone who reads my work should know that I'm open-minded and I'm fair and honest, good at eating crow if it turns out that I'm mistaken about something. 
And that's the point of the show. I, I get to think out loud with people who either know better than me or at least people who can offer me a perspective that I wouldn't otherwise have been privy to. For the first time, however, since hosting the podcast, I've come across an issue that I'm very hesitant to think through out loud, even though I haven't been in the past. And that's the issue of race and racism. Uh, if I'm anything at all, uh, I'm progressive. I very much believe that we've not landed on a societal structure that we can just leave alone. Um, and when it comes to racism in America, I think that anybody who cares to look hard enough, uh, and maybe you don't even have to look that hard, can plainly see that it, racism not only exists, but it, it's alive to the extent that it causes destruction among some marginalized communities. And um, you know, we might disagree, but for various reasons that I, I don't think we'll probably talk about too much in this episode, it's not, I'm not going too much on philosophy here, but I, I do believe that black Americans are uniquely vulnerable broadly to experiencing racism in its worst forms. That said, uh, I'm seeing a lot of mixed messages about what it means to be racist or anti-racist or humanist, anything-ist. Mm -hmm. And I haven't yet located a banner that I'm willing to just to, to fly over whatever my cause is. And, and unfortunately, I'm also concerned to talk too much about my thoughts or my confusions or my beliefs about what racism is or isn't. And not because my view is radical or in poor taste. I don't think it's either of those things. But I hesitate to talk about these issues because of the potential that I'll be misunderstood or misrepresented or taken out of context, um, or that even just that it'll be impossible to have a, um, a reasoned conversation about it. Um, I'll wrap this up, but I, I would even have trouble admitting all of this publicly that I just told you, except that people in my discussion groups also won't touch the topic with a 10 foot pole. And these are people with a really broad range of socioeconomic status and people with a wide range of racial and cultural and ethnic backgrounds. So I'm hoping today that I can begin to ease some of that tension, have just a thoughtful conversation. That's where Bridget Mack comes in. Um, a member of one of my discussion forums echoed this reluctance to think out loud about the topic of race. And this was shortly after seeing basically peaceful protests across the country while also rioting and looting in some areas. And one of the concerns that I heard was basically that it's taboo or even could be considered racist to say something as seemingly innocuous as um, it's okay to protest, but it's not okay to steal from stores or burn down buildings. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so to the fact, just to the idea that this was something that people were worried to say, I didn't have a great response to. Another participant then in the discussion forum showed me this video. It was created by Bridget and it's titled... <laughs> Uh, a lot of forethought into the the headline. It's called "Guess What My White Neighbor Just Came and Said to Me." <laughs> you know, sort of sort of a satire. Well, I'll let you talk about it, but presumably a satire on you know headlines that you're used to and people are accustomed to seeing. Uh, the video is just a beautiful message about Bridges' take on some of the messaging that's happening regarding race in America. It, nuanced, ethical, motivating. I've seen some of Bridges' other content since then, and I, I just I think that's the quality of discourse that people who follow you are accustomed to. Um, so Bridget, I'll turn it to you. I would like to talk about your video and what inspired it about some of your most core values and ideas, especially regarding the ways we should and shouldn't be talking about race. Before we get into it, will you fill people in just as briefly as you'd like um, on your background, your work, things that keep you busy on a regular basis? Well, my, um, Producing content and writing keeps me busy like 100% of the time. I'm a pastor's wife. So if I am not producing content and working and um, providing coaching services online, I'm doing it um, here in, in real time, person to person. I never thought in a million years that I'd be doing this. You know, my, I used to work with Habitat for Humanity. I've always known that I've wanted to work with people. Uh, writing has been something that I've done ever since the third grade, and it was just like therapy for me. I would go and, you know, when I would uh, have a good day, bad day, I'd just go write it in my journal or create little poems. I didn't decide to do this professionally until about 2010. Um, my husband and I have a nonprofit, Go Ministries, and what we do is we write and produce uh, stage plays, and we um, perform them or minister them for free to the public. 
And so what we do is we take real life situations and we put them on stage and we offer um, solutions to the problems. We offer scriptural insight into the, the issue. Um, I didn't really, I was, I've always been a blogger, um, but the, my whole platform changed for me when my sister passed away uh, in 2011. Mm -hmm. My whole view on life kind of changed. You know, grief can open you up to so many things and the insight on, you know, being here today and gone tomorrow, it just, it did something to me. Her leaving opened something up in me. It was, for a long time, I thought it was a void of her being gone, but while it was that, you know, it was just God opening me up. And now I just speak, I'm bilingual in pain because I know it at a level that I never experienced it before. She was the, the baby and, you know, she died suddenly in her sleep and it was just overwhelming there. And, you know, I've always been raised in the church. I've always been, you know, in somebody's congregation somewhere receiving the word, but I did not realize how self-righteous I was until I was exposed to that level of pain and I was able to identify with what so many other people were thinking. And the moment I kind of opened up to and saw the pain, purpose behind the pain, that's when God opened the doors for my platform. And, you know, 2016, my first video went viral. And ever since then, it's just kind of went forth. And since then, I've been producing video after video, you know, doing blog posts. I've written my first book. I'm working on the second one. I went on tour and just encouraging people who don't have a voice to open up their mouth and speak, you know, because their voices have been taken away from them. So mm -hmm. that, that's my mission. My, my, uh, one of my themes is when life won't give you a lemon, grow your own. And that is where I was at one point in my life where, you know, everybody else was complaining about life giving them lemons, but, you know, we were so down and out, we couldn't even afford the lemon, but we had a seed. So I took what God gave me, I planted it, and it's been rooting, it's been growing. And so that gives some pretty good context for, for why you would create a video like the one that I was just talking about. You said that yeah. you take issues that are happening, maybe not even necessarily, issues might not be the right word, but just themes that are relevant and mm -hmm. providing some angle on them that you know people are trying to express, but maybe haven't thought about delicately or, or feel like they can't express them. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it is. Even when I did that video, guess what my white um, neighbor just said to me um, in the beginning of the video, I don't know if you remember, you know, I told him, I said, you know, typically when I'm talking about issues, when someone has lost their life and it's something that I'm talking about on my platform, I never identified their race. I just say young woman, young man was killed. I said, but, you know, today I'm going to give into socialism because I understand uh, sensationalism, excuse me. I understand that a lot of you wouldn't have clicked on this video if I would have said, guess what my neighbor said. And right. so because of the fact that I identified her based on her color, knew that by using that, that was going to get the people there. But I wanted their ears so that they could hear and see that not everyone is bad. You know, not everyone is racist. And racism is not limited to just white people. You know, racism is something that all races, all colors experience and have within them. Uh, you know, I was met with a lot of support, but then, of course, there was always naysayers in there. And, you know, they were saying just because one white person came to you. And I'm like, you know, it's not just one white person. This is just one person that I've chosen to talk about in this moment in time. And I hear what you say about, you know, being hesitant to talk about it because of the backlash. And, and I think that's what the enemy wants. That's what the people with agenda want. They want to silence you. They want to make you feel uncomfortable about talking about the hard issues. But just like the African-American ha race has every right to ask the hard question and make demands, so does the Caucasian race and, and, you know, Hispanic and Asian, no matter what, you know, it, it's unfair um, to demand justice for one particular race by trying to shut up another. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've, you know, been called everything in the book, but a child of God by so many people, you know, saying that I was um, a sellout, but, you know, the, the truth is the truth when it comes to uh, racism in order for us to get a full understanding because even though we all bleed the same, we'll be honest, the cultures are different. You know, some of the upbringings are different, even though there are similarities, you know, even with the dialect and the way we, you know, 
talk and so forth, there are differences there. And if we learn to be able to come together and ask the hard questions and, you know, say, well, why does this, without people wearing their feelings on their shoulders, then so many problems would be alleviated even quicker. But there is a sense of entitlement that I am seeing in all races, you know, and people are using that to their advantage to try to get leverage and, and fulfill their personal agenda. And it's not fair, you know, no matter how you slice it. Fair enough. Thank you for allowing me to just interrupt the conversation for a moment. I want to remind you that this show is brought to you by you. We run solely on donations from our listeners like you. You can support us if you feel so inclined by rating and reviewing us on your preferred podcast app. But if you'd like to make a monetary contribution to the show, you can make a donation at the PayPal link that's in the description, the show notes. Or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash the social exchange. That's patreon.com slash the social exchange. Becoming a patron gets you early access to all regular episodes. And we offer more rewards the more you donate. So, again, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the social exchange. Thanks, as always, to all of our patrons, Dean Lemaire, Christy McPherson, Nuncio de Martino, Susan Lennon, James Stax, Chris L., Leon Nahufahu, Sherry Chandler, D.D. Stout, Chris Hanlon, Andre Pompel, Carter Vermont, Rick Barnett, and Earl Inigo, John Holt, Layla Ferguson, Mary Kay Villaverde, Michelle, Nancy, Sean, Regina, Tim, Tucker, Christian, Tom Rhodes, Linda Rhodes, Susan Matthew, Kathleen Cochran, Marjorie Israel, Diane T., and Trevor. Again, thank you to all of our patrons, and if you'd like to become a Patreon subscriber, go to patreon.com slash the social exchange. Now back to episode number 59 with Bridget Mack. What was it that your white neighbor did come and say to you? Well, I mean, we she was one of the first people that came and actually introduced her stuff to us when we moved into the neighborhood. But I actually saw her going from house to house. I was outside with my, my kids and my nieces and nephews. They were playing volleyball and I was out there being all country bumpkin yelling and, and, and cheering on the team. And I saw her go from house to house talking to people. And then she walked over. I didn't recognize her at first um, because she was off a little ways. And when she came into the yard, I mean, her eyes were just so full. And she came in and she said, I just wanted to come over here and tell you that I am so sorry um, for uh, what you all may have been faced with or going through. I just want you all to know that I don't think the way I see everything that's going on um, in the news and in society. And I wanted you all to know that I love you. I know that you all are you know, upstanding people. I know that you kids are doing wonderfully and I'm just, I, I see what's going on and I want to let you all know that I don't think that way. And she didn't have to do that. She didn't owe me any explanation. She hasn't done anything to me, but she wanted to be a voice because of the fact that she saw, and I'm pretty sure she might've heard some conversations too amongst people that she may know personally. I don't know. But she just felt led to come and let everybody know that this is one neighbor who does not feel that way about the African American race. And when she was speaking to me, she was speaking to me, but she made sure that she made eye contact, I noticed, with my son and with my nephews, you know, mm -hmm. because a lot of this that's going on is targeted towards the African American male. A lot of the issues that we are having, the legit issues that we are having, it is to the African American males primarily and she made eye contact with them and she wanted to let them know and tears were just going down her eyes and we just hugged you know I, I, we weren't worried about COVID or social distancing or anything I, you know she needed you know that hug and I needed it back from her and I mean she didn't have to do that but she did she just wanted us to know that we could be safe around her and I will always appreciate her for that. I was just going to ask what you said in response, but it sounds like your, your actions responded rather than words. Well, yeah, I, well, of course we, we hugged, but then I also told her that I am not naive to the fact that I know that a lot of people, uh, white people are going through now because now 
for a lot of groups, they're just classifying all white people as racist. No matter what you say, how you say it, what you do or what have you, if it's not something that they want to hear, then you're a racist. If it's not something that's going to, you know, make their chest puff up, then you are a racist. And I told her, I'm not leading you to the fact that you all are dealing, you know, with the backlash of from what the bad apples are doing. It's kind of like the police officers. You have good ones and you have bad ones, but the good ones are paying the price for what the bad ones did as well. And it's not fair. Right. And I told her that I too know that this is something that you all are dealing with and you're safe with us as well. If you ever need us, we're here as well. So there was a sisterhood to some degree that was established there, which it was always there because like I said, when we moved here about four or five years ago, she was one of the first ones that welcomed us here. And so, uh, you know, it, it, would, it wasn't needed, but you know, she just confirmed it and it warranted a hug that day. It sounds like you're somebody who's just open to hearing from people. And I imagine that inspires a lot of people coming in to talk to you about things that they normally wouldn't talk to other people about. I'm wondering if you have experienced any of this. Um, I haven't seen many people at all because I've been locked down due to COVID. Mm -hmm. We've done very minimal traveling or anything like that. And I think that's probably true for most people. Mm -hmm. But I heard a story the other day from someone I know, um, a white man and his son, and they were in a public park here in Vermont near Lake Champlain and they had a remote controlled boat and they noticed a group of people close to them who seemed interested in the boat and what they were doing and that group of people was black and he told me that in any other similar circumstance in his life he would have with little hesitation approached those people after having noticed that they were interested in him and they, he probably would have invited them to control the boat if they wanted to, or at least carried on a conversation with them. But he said that with everything going on, he felt really self-conscious about approaching them. I mean, this was just days after George Floyd's death and the beginning of protests. And he didn't feel self-conscious about approaching them because he had a problem crossing racial or cultural barriers. I mean, they obviously had a lot in common. They presumably all lived in that area. They visited the same public space on their sunny day off. Everyone seemed to be in a good mood. There was a lot that they all had in common, but he was telling me that because of what's going on in the news, he was worried that approaching this group of people might be some kind of faux pas, or maybe they wouldn't want him to approach them, or, or they would have some kind of reservation about him doing so. So for the first time in his life, he was saying he was cautious to approach a group of friendly strangers, and it was by virtue of racial differences. And, and again, not because he had a knee-jerk reaction to be wary of racial differences, but because he's being told in so many different ways that he has an implicit bias and that that bias is oppressive. I mean, I know that's one story, yeah. but it seems to me if that's a story that's at all common, then it would seem so counterproductive. I can't imagine myself in a situation where because of the color of someone's skin, that would be the defining factor of me being nervous about having a conversation or, or, or talking with them or just enjoying life with them. And I wonder if you've heard anybody talking about anything similar. I've had a lot of people inbox me personally and tell me that they were, you know, they made their comments to me behind the scenes because they were afraid of what the backlash would be if they were to say something publicly. Um, you know, most of my following is online. So that's most of the time how people reach out to me. And a lot of them have said that there have been times where they chose not to come in, even though it was something that they really wanted to respond to, or they chose not to post something on their page, or they overheard a conversation and they chose not to uh, respond to it because they were afraid of what would be um, said. And the, one of the things that I've tried to teach people for years on my platform is that when it comes to race is not really about color. It's a, it's a matter of the heart, you know, because if it was all racism was only a color issue, then no black person would ever like a white person or no white mm -hmm. person would ever like a black person. It's a matter of the, the heart and what you have going on on the inside. And I really depend on God to, to give me with discernment on who to approach and who not to approach, who to talk to, you know, when to speak and just, you know, when to just let it go. Because, you know, I could probably come and have a conversation with you, but then I've had more um, conflicting conversations with black people about this than I have white people. So it's really not 
the race is about the person, you know, it's, it's just, it's the view of the person. And I know a lot of people now are making moves in fear because they don't want it. There's been so much chaos with the burning down of buildings, which I don't get. I mean, I, I actually did a, um, a live on that and I got some backlash. Most of the people that don't agree with me, unfortunately, are the millennials and the, the younger generation. Uh, they feel like you can rebuild the city, but you can't reclaim a life, you know, you know, burn their stuff down. And even what well, somebody, they did not agree with me when I, I told them, oh, I forget where it was, where they were burning down a Wendy's. And I was like, you're not hurt. And it was in their community. I was like, okay, people literally just went back to work. You know, there are people that really depended on that income. Some of them hadn't received the unemployment or the, the benefits they needed. They were living from paycheck to paycheck. And that could have been one of your neighbor's jobs that you just burnt down. Now they're back to square one, you know, and you're not, you know, you're not doing anything for the people. You're setting the people back because taxes are going to be raised. Something is going to be raised in order for us to pay back for these damages. Burning things down have never happened. If it, it worked, if it did, then it would have worked back in the days of Rodney King. But you've been burning things down for years and it still remains the same. How about we act like adults and sit down and have a conversation and don't get mad at the people if they may not necessarily understand where you're coming from. Be an adult, act like you got some sense and talk to them and, and explain. And then allow them to ask you hard questions and you ask them hard questions and if you don't agree, agree to disagree and then go your separate ways and, and just be respectful in that manner. But that's too much common sense right there for people. That's too much. Mm. You know, they rather have chaos. They rather have, you know, the arguing and the name calling and, and so forth. They rather not have any type of law and order because you need it. At the end of the day, you need it. And if I were to be honest, I now my brother has, like I said, it's been targeted more so towards the African American male. My brother has, my husband has, my 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 son has. You know, they had issues with the police, you know, where the police questioned them and so forth. My issues that I have, and, you know, some people say that because my complexion is brighter than, you know, the next um, sister with a little bit more melanin, they say I get special favors, you know, <laughs> which is ridiculous. But yeah. the issues that I've had with cops, the one bad experience I had was with an African-American cop. And when I had to go to court, it was a Caucasian judge that dropped the charges. So that's why I tell people, y'all, it's really not about color. It's about the heart. And when you're dealing with people who have issues and conditions of the heart, then you're not going to get anywhere doing the same thing you've always done. In order to get what you never had, you got to do what you've never done. And sometimes that requires just sitting down and having a conversation. But anytime people come to me and they say that they're hesitant to speak, I ask them, did God lead you to say something? And if they say yes, I said, then you should have said something. If they say, I don't know, then you be quiet until you feel that peace about going forward. But whatever you do, don't move in fear. Fear keeps you frozen. First of all, beautifully said. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <it's, laughs> it seems to me, and this is, you know, I, I'll be above board in saying that I, I live in a bubble here in Vermont, we are, I don't know the percentage, it's got to be something like 95% white. Mm -hmm. And I live in a town that is fairly well on the socioeconomic totem pole. Mm -hmm. And I work at a school where people are fairly wealthy. So the noises that we make about politics and social issues are, I mean, we just don't have the same point of view as somebody in an inner city anywhere. So you know, that aside, it does seem to me that racism tends to be a lack of understanding or an inability to understand um, or an unwillingness to understand another person for who they are. And I think that's what you're saying when you mean, I think that's what you mean when you're saying uh, racism is a problem of the heart, which, so when we were talking in, in, my, in my group, and this was a private thread, about, you know, should I even say people ought not to burn stores to the ground? And I'm thinking my knee-jerk response is, well, of course you should say that. I mean, that is something that I always, my tendency is always to rebuild something that seems broken rather than to completely annihilate it. What I always work with is, you know, a dialectic. So there's a thesis, antithesis, 
and uh, synthesis. And my thesis would be something like just further destruction is only exacerbating the problem of racism as I see it, which is a lack of understanding or an inability to understand or an unwillingness to understand. Uh, it just makes the problem worse. I could imagine uh, the antithesis of that remark being something like, yeah, maybe so. Then again, I've tried speaking. I've tried picking myself up by the bootstraps. I've tried conversation. I've tried everything and I feel like I have no options. So I'm burning it. And there's so we've escaped reason at that point, but I wonder if that's, if that's a thread of just a livelihood that you accept somewhere. And um, how do you respond to someone who, who feels that way? Almost nihilistic because they feel like a, a lack of some way to go. My response is always the same. Two wrongs don't make it a right unless you're doing math. And when you look at math, it's still a problem that needs to be solved. Okay. Mm. So I understand that there are people that have been trying to do things the right way, not just with racism, but just in life in general. You know, they've been trying to do it the right way. And it seems like they're banging their head against the wall. But when you go backwards and you start, you know, performing acts or, or making the decisions that you're going to have to hide from, that you're going to have to always look over your shoulder about, then you're just making your problem even bigger. It's not for you to digress or to go backwards and, you know, start becoming a vigilante because it's not working in your time. It's time when you don't see any type of progress. That's when you need to just take some collective steps backwards, sit down and then rethink the whole problem and see what it is that you're not doing or what you need to be doing. You might have been speaking, but were you saying the right words? Were you talking to the right people? Did you surround yourself around people that were going to help you um, get the mission taken care of? And a lot of these people, you know, go back to the burning and so forth, because let's just be honest, there are criminals and there are antagonists out there that are just taking advantage of the situation. If you really cared about your right. name, if you really cared about, you know, racism, if you really cared about getting justice or making sure that everyone is treated equally, then you would set the, be the standard that you're trying to get them to live by. And you are not going to be heard. And I did this and I was called the, let me put this, do you know I was called the C word? I didn't even know what the C word was until the lady, <laughs> my nail, explained it to me last week. I was like, okay, I knew that it was a bad word, but I just didn't know what it meant. Now I got it. But I was called that word when I, I told them, I said, listen, you don't get anything done when you are breaking the law. When they are riding, when they are yelling, when they are throwing the little Molotov cocktails, you're having to hide your face. You know, everybody's yelling, but nobody's being heard. Everybody's, you know, pounding their fists, but it looks like a mob. And because you're not being heard, nothing is going to be done. You don't get anything done when people are yelling and shouting at each other. You don't get anything done when there are fires and, and people being hurt and, and officers being shot and innocent bystanders being shot and killed and hurt and harmed. Nothing gets done. It's just another mess that needs to be cleaned up. And while you are, and I explain this to them, while you all are out there doing these rioting and, and whatever it is that you're doing to cause all this chaos, you're actually giving the people that you want to... Um, serve time for what they've done, you're giving them more time to come up with a defense. Now, all of the attention is off of the people who created the, made the crime, and now it's on you. And so now they have enough time to go back and just create a defense, and then they're going to build it off of what the bigger mess that you've made. Use common sense. But the problem is a lot of these kids were born into this world thinking they know everything. They don't want to listen. I even had one person insult our ancestors ancestors as African-Americans saying, we're not our ancestors. We're not going to take what they took. Are you serious? So you're going to sit up here and you're going to try to insult all of those who literally lost their lives fighting for our rights, fighting to become free, fighting for the ability to sit at the front of the bus and drink from water fountains and get the same education, which you, by the way, have. Because frankly, I'm sick and tired of these little young people talking about we've been oppressed for 400 years. I don't know nobody who's 400 years old. I'm 
Okay. I was able to go to college just, and that was something that my grandparents weren't afforded the ability to do. I can yeah. vote. I can sit wherever I doggone well, please. I can drink from any type of water fountain, even though I'm a bit of a drummer for open, you ain't going to catch me doing it, but I will drink from, you know, a water fountain if I choose. We have rights and privileges that they didn't have with each generation. And this is on the white and black side. Every generation is supposed to have it a little bit better than the generation before. And you have it way better than they did 400 years ago. But instead of taking the resources that you have, you're sitting up here trying to live as if you were a slave. Baby, you ain't no slave. If you're a slave to anything, you are a slave to your own oppressed mind because you're trying to make up excuses because your tail don't want to get out there and do what you got to do. And that is for the people who are, I'm not talking about the ones who are legit fighting for rights, but I'm talking about the ones who are using this as an excuse to go and cause more chaos and problems, but they ain't nothing but a bunch of mess makers. I'm sorry. The country came out in me. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that actually is a good lead into something that was on my mind. You are a black woman from the South, and you mentioned that it's not like you haven't experienced racism. I mean, we've all, I, I say racism as a sliding scale, but I would imagine that it's more apparent to you as a black woman from the South when it's happening, especially if it's happening blatantly. Have you, I mean, would you be comfortable talking about any of your experiences uh, with racism and how you responded to them? Oh man. Uh, they were where we lived. Cause I'm from Gordon, Alabama, which is a small town outside of Dothan, Alabama. And where we lived, I think they were still having KKK meetings when I was a little girl, maybe 15 minutes away, 15, 20 minutes wow. away. And so um, we've never had an issue, of course, when nobody's com coming and burning crosses in our yard. Uh, but it is, racism is systematic to a degree. Um, you know, I saw that a lot. My mom had to go quite a few times um, to our schools and go toe to toe with the different teachers um, about comments that they would make towards us. I mean, I think it was in 92, it was two years before I graduated, I believe, we even had a riot out at our school. I have the newspaper upstairs in my, my uh, high school yearbook from where the, the black students had a riot because they were tired of the principal and how she showed favoritism, you know, towards the white students. They did have more privileges than us when it came to scholarships and getting certain information when it came to um, opportunities if you want to go to college and, and you'll be in the different clubs and some of the teachers saying things that they weren't supposed to say. I even hear since we've moved here, one of the first things a white teacher said to us, and this was four or five years ago when we moved to this school system, my daughter came home with an 80 on her tests and the teacher wrote up there great and so my daughter was so excited my oldest daughter now and I was like baby I said 80 is okay an 80 is not great and I said a hundred and more is what we consider to be great and she was like well my teacher said that making grades like this is is great and I was like no baby you always work to do better I don't want you to limit yourself so at the next parent teacher conference she because my we came from a primarily black um school system. And when I went and I met with the teacher and I said, I get that you're trying to educate, you know, my child and keep her motivated. I said, but an 80 is okay. I said, we want to strive for our children to um, do better. And she looked at me and she said, considering where you all came from, I don't see your child making an A in my class. Wow. And so I, what's that supposed to mean? And she was like, you know, considering the, you know, the area that you all come from, I said, I'm trying to make sure that I did not misunderstand what you were saying, you know? And she was like, well, I, I, I don't, I don't see her um, making an A in the class. And of course my daughter graduated with honors, you know, she, she <laughs> proved her wrong. And my son, when we moved here, he was egged by the neighbor's son. And they told him that they didn't want any N words here in the neighborhood. And he was six, seven. And so I'm having to explain to my son what an N-word is and why they called him that and why they threw eggs at him. And so it's, it's, it's a struggle because now you're teaching them to love people because, and let them know that not all people are prejudiced, but now they don't know how to tell who's prejudiced, who's not, who's good, who's bad. And you know, you're at a loss, you know, how do you find that balance? You don't want to get stuck in that tunnel that all white people are bad and all white people hate black people, 
But when it starts happening more and more, and my son has, out of all of my kids, he's been called the N-word since he's been here. He's been called a nappy head. You know, he's been, people have threatened to shoot him. We've been to the, I mean, even had one boy that arranged for another kid to come and jump him. And then they did jump him. We just got out of court from pressing charges on that kid last week. And so it is, it's, um, it's scary. And I understand the fear of black mamas because we, we do, every time our children step out the door, every time our husband step out the door, it is a fear factor there. When the police pull us over, we are a little bit, a lot more conscious. We don't make any sudden movements in the car we, because we don't know who we are dealing with. It's not usually until you let the window down and then the officer starts talking to you, which we haven't been having any altercations with any officers, that you really know whether or not you're dealing with a good cop or a bad cop. And so we really approach with caution and then proceed maturely. Whereas now there are a lot of people, they, the moment a cop says something to them, they are all over the place. So, I mean, I, my family does face it, primarily my son. I mean, I, I saw it in school, but the whole time my mom and dad, they told me, this is what you're going to have to deal with, but keep in mind that all people are this way. And so they had to rehearse that to us over and over and over. And my mom told me, she said, always seek God for guidance on discernment on who's good and who's bad. And I've lived by that principle. And that, what I believe, is what helped me keep, be grounded, or remain grounded. So you were talking about how, I mean, everybody in this generation has rights that the previous generations didn't have and opportunities and freedoms, knowledge that past generations didn't have. And, um, but it sounds like even if we didn't, and even if the black community didn't, that the way forward wouldn't be to, you know, like a regressive stance, like violence toward the system, it would still be your values to it, it would still be within your value set to move forward through respect and understanding. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that I might be misrepresenting you there, but that seems to be what you're saying. Yeah, I, well, we're going to have to go ahead and accept is that they were there will always be racism here, and I think the 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 focus is on trying to um, force people to love you or or submit to you or do whatever you want them to do no matter what. The Mm. solution is not going to be in trying to change the mindset of people who have already decided that they want to hate you. I think the solution is in creating a community of support among the people who love you no matter what. No matter what your color, no matter what your creed, no matter what they're going to be, there's a community there that's going to have each other's backs. And the microphone has been given to all of the the mess makers and the people who are chaotic and they have just filled their minds and their hearts with hate. I mean, the Bible refers to them as being reprobate. You know, they went into that place. They're going to stay at that place. They're going to die there. But people are for, you know, a lot of people are focused on trying to change the folks who don't want to change. Let them be over there. We gather the ones who are going to work together as a community and come up with solutions to the problem. And I'm all for protesting if you want to let your voice be heard, but walking down the road is not gonna change any laws and it's not gonna build any bridges and it's not gonna strengthen any communities. At some point, each individual community needs to come together and air out their differences and know that we're not gonna always agree with the other person, but as long as we can come to a mutual agreement of what we need to do going forward, then things will start getting better. You've heard of the book, White Fragility? Uh-uh. Okay, so it'll be interesting to get your take. I, I would love if you, um, if you got back to me on this after you check it out, but it's a book by a woman who comes in and does consulting. I mean, she makes thousands of dollars an hour consulting workplaces on how to be less racist. Mm-hmm. And the, the through line of the book is that every white person is an abhorrent racist and that you're doing it with every breath you take with every look that you give, uh, with every subtle movement, you're being racist and offending somebody. And it's, that's the continuity and the reality. And all we as white people can do is constantly work on trying to break that continuity and catch ourselves being racist so we're a little bit less racist. Um, so, I mean, everything that she's saying, of course, completely opposes your message. And it's I, I see the book as being counterproductive, but this is actually 
a New York Times best se- number one bestseller. And uh, people are taking these kinds of trainings at schools and workplaces, uh, like kind of an anti-racism training. I'm interested to get your take on just the, the concept. I think everybody to some degree is a little bit racist. I'm, I'm not going to even lie. I, 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 I'm going to tell you, my husband and I were actually driving somewhere one time and it was a really nice neighborhood. And I guess you can say we were racist, you know, on all races because we had been driving through that neighborhood back and forth. And one day when we were not driving through it, but driving past it, one day uh, we were walking and we saw a couple walking out of the house. And I was like, wait a minute, a black couple lives there? And he was like, and so we went through again. We saw a few days later, we were like, black people. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Progress. (laughs) Love it. You know? You, you know, we're happy. And I'm like, so I guess to some degree you could say that. And I've been contemplating about doing another Mama Mac video entitled Black and White, because for the most part, even in behind the door, you know, in the, the privacy of our homes, when we have conversations and so forth, you know, when you hear about something that's happened, a robbery or murder, you know, a lot of times people ask, was he black or white? You know, uh, what happened? Was it black or white? A lot of times that's the first question that comes out of people's mouth. They want to know what color they are. Right. And so I'm like, okay, we ask it. We know we love the other race, but why is that so important if we're not just a little bit, a little bit biased when it comes to your own color, when it comes mm-hmm. to your own race, you know? And I think that everybody have a little bit of bias when it comes to that, because that's what you're comfortable with. If you, most people, who have been raised around different cultures, it won't even come to mind. But, you know, like me being in Alabama, I was around primarily black people. We had white people that go to our school and everything, but my circle was primarily black people. Like, you know, you were saying that you live in a predominantly white community. So it's always a little bit of bias there that some people may or may not be able to control. Case in point, years ago, my husband and I went to Tennessee and this was our first time going. And when we went there, we went to the lodge to sign in. And the lady at the front gate, the at the desk, she was like, I know you all are visitors. And I was like, okay, is it the way we dress? Are we dressed like fancy or city-ish or you know what? And so I didn't get it. And so when we went and checked into our room, we were going around town. It was a cute little town. I'm like, where are the black people? I don't see no black people around here. <laughs> then I, this is what I was thinking. I was like, I'm scared. I don't see any black people and my husband was like, that's what she meant because it was a predominantly white community, but nobody mistreated us. Everybody was nice. You know, we went and enjoyed the little vacay. We went to Red Lobster and we saw one black waiter and we were like, oh, okay, a brother, there you go. We're not alone, you know? But I think that everybody, if they were to be honest, there are some twerks and twin tinges here and there that we all face that may be detrimental some may be harmless, but to say that the white race just needs to cater at 100% to the black race is just, in my opinion, a way to sell more books and get in to these companies that are struggling with racial issues. I don't know. Hmm. I think so. I think you're probably right about that. I, I mean, I think like the, the most huge companies in America, I feel like you can take that course and training and say that you read the book and then sort of wipe your hands and say, all right, we've done what we need to do to let everyone in the public know that we are anti-racist. You know, we're doing the right thing and making the right noises rather than doing what you're suggesting and involving yourself with other people who may have differences and conversing with them and asking questions. So anyway. Within itself is racist though. You can't have one person speak for an entire race. I cannot speak for the entire black race. I mean, because, you know, just because we're, you know, we're black doesn't mean that we all agree. I mean, right. I'm married to my husband and I love him. We just celebrated 24 years of marriage, but we don't even agree, you know, all the time. I think that what you have to do is just take it one step at a time and address the issues as they arise. But to give one uh, standard possible solution to, you know, multiple issues that could arise, you're setting yourself up for trouble. You know, I mean, if she's written that book and she's going and consulting companies, I'm wondering why those companies haven't stepped forward and say, hey, this is how we've managed to get over things here. And they haven't become a 
a, an example of what to do and how to service the community or how, why that company hasn't stepped forward with, with all the protests and riots that are going on. Having you on the show and it happened to be like, it was a beautiful way that it came together. You're a black woman speaking out on an issue very comfortably. Um, well, I mean, maybe comfortably is not the right word, but very. Um, comfortably is the word. I can talk about it. I'm good. It, you didn't have to really think much before you spoke. It was thoughtful, but you didn't have to go into deep thought about just the right thing to say because you were very confident. I guess that's the word I'm looking for, that what you're saying is both your truth and to some extent, the truth. And um, it, it was perfect because you were black, you were saying it, you were saying something that I felt like I couldn't say and people that I know felt like they couldn't say. And I almost, I had this hesitation, I guess similar to the guy in the park who was hesitant to reach out to the, the people who were sitting across from him. I had this hesitation, like, is Bridget going to think that I'm inviting her on my show gratuitously because she's a black woman uh, rather than because of the content that she put out that I appreciate. I, I mean, after, after looking at different things, I, I could see that the answer is almost certainly no, you won't think that, but you know, it's something that I had to, it is something that I thought about and something that I worry about. So if I get your message clearly and correctly, it's that we're all going to face some hurdles in life. Some of them are going to be in race involved and some of them are going to be completely unfair, but the way to ameliorate that problem isn't to force people to be more fair because the forcefulness itself will create more opportunities for people to be more unjust, but rather try to immerse ourselves, no matter what race you are, in some sense-making, love, kindness, understanding, and appreciation. And that is not going to change things right away because as you were saying, we're always going to have some comfort with people that we can see ourselves in more so than people than we can't. But that's kind of the fun and the interesting part about learning more about people. Um, so we're never going to solve, uh, maybe, but it doesn't seem like we'll ever solve racism, no matter what races you're talking about. But we can certainly continue to, as Martin Luther King said, uh, bend the moral arc toward justice. Um, am I leaving anything out there, you think? No, oh, and I, one thing I, I, I encourage you to do is, you know, just be resilient when it comes to talking about the hard questions. And I know that even with the, um, you know, Caucasian race right now, a lot of people are afraid of saying how they feel because, you know, if it's not something in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, you're automatically being a racist, but never let them take your voice away from you. I mean, there are always going to be people that's going to find something wrong with what you say, no matter how, how you say it and, you know, how well it's explained. They will put the in other words in your, your mouth. And so that, that's something that you can't get away from. I mean, but the only way that things will get better to some degree is if people are allowed to honestly voice how they feel and what they don't understand. And that's the only way. Which, by the way, if you had a, is there anything that you would like to ask me as a Black woman that you are hesitant? Any hard questions? Why do y'all do this or what, what do anything? Because I'm, I'm the type of person I answer it. You've pretty much summed up what I was hoping that you would sum up, but the fact that you're putting yourself out there as somebody who's willing to talk no matter what, and even if something's uncomfortable or sounds like it's misled or misguided, the question itself, you're up for answering that. Uh, it really speaks a lot of your character. And I think, I think that when people listen to this, just like when I listen to your talk, they're going to get a sense of relief that, okay, you know, we've been hearing a lot of noise, a lot of headlines, like the one you're kind of picking on. Like, did you see what this white person did to this black person? Or did you see what this white woman did to this black man? Or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. They think that that's the overarching truth and that any, any other questions or hesitations are at the margins. But really, if you talk individual to individual, I'm sure that the opposite is true. So I want to thank you for being someone who's receptive, understanding and receptive to questions that people might have, even if it means that they have them because they see themselves as differently than you, you differently than them. I, I think that's a ray of hope for the future and it makes me feel at ease to be able to think and talk and to treat people the way that I think people deserve to be treated. So 
Thanks for coming on. Thanks for talking about it. I wonder if I've left anything out that you think that uh, listeners of the show. Yeah, um, the only thing I would end is. When I found you. Yes, yes, we are all about love. Darkness for the dark.